Hello everybody, it's Glitter Informer, and thank you all so much for 100 subs. I know I already thanked you all for 100 subs in my episode 7 review, but the 100 sub milestone only happened after I finished recording, so I was only able to edit that in afterwards. I wanted to restate it here so I could actually say it with my voice. Before we start on episode 8, remember how back in the first few episodes, Sora's hands would tremble before she would transform into Kira Sky to show how afraid she was? Well, that hasn't been happening, and it actually isn't because the writers have forgotten about that plot point. See, the trembling thing stopped in episode 4 when Kira Prism joined the team. It's a really subtle way of showing just how much Mashiro being at her side means to Sora. With that said, let's get this episode started. Our episode starts with that orange bird who usually hangs out on the roof. Remember how I've said in every single episode since episode 2 that the bird will be important later? Well, today's the day! He's finally important! Let's go! As a flock of ducks fly across the sky, the bird watches them and his eyes tremble with emotion. Also, the bird isn't sitting above the front entrance as usual. Instead, he's sitting right outside the window of Sora and Elle's room. Elle's trying to get her rattle toy, but the problem is, it's on top of Sora's bed, and when Elle tries to reach it, she falls over. But just before she hits her head, a mysterious boy catches her. The boy has an orange jacket that has very similar shades of orange to the ones on the bird. He has a red zipper shaped similarly to the red necktie the bird is wearing. He has a poop-shaped tuft of hair on his head that looks just like the big brown feathers on the bird's head. I wonder if the boy and the bird could possibly be related in some way? Sora comes into the room to bring Elle some formula, but she notices something is amiss because Elle is holding the rattle that was supposed to be out of her reach, and what's more, the window is open. But other than that, there's no sign of anybody having been there. The bird is sitting right outside the window, as innocent looking as can be. Later that night, Sora briefly leaves the room to say goodnight to Mashiro before going to bed. We already saw her in her pajamas in episode 5, but here we get a better look at this outfit. It's always really neat to see pretty cures with their hair down. It's a surprise to see how long their hair really is. Anyways, while Sora is gone, the bird boy comes back into the room to say goodnight to Elle. However, Sora's gotten an intelligence upgrade since last episode. See, when she said out loud that she was going to say goodnight to Mashiro, she was lying. She just wanted to lure whoever the home intruder was into the room by making them think it was unoccupied, and the boy played right into her hands. She comes right back into her room and is understandably pissed that this complete and utter stranger is hanging out with the baby. In fact, she even suspects that he might even be an accomplice of Kabatones. He tries to jump out the window to escape, but Sora goes right after him and pins him to the ground. And then, much to her surprise, Sora finds that between her hands and the ground isn't the boy that she spotted, but rather a bird. The boy's a shapeshifter. But then, Yo-Yo comes out and tells Sora to let the bird go because he's a friend of hers. So she does. And for the very first time, the bird speaks. He says that his name is Tsubasa. That's Japanese for wing, by the way. That'll be important later. Mashiro's watching this all go down from her bedroom window, by the way, and she's absolutely floored to see a bird talking. But birds talking are a normal occurrence for Sora. In fact, it happens all the time where she comes from. In particular, she recalls that there's a particular tribe of birds from Skyland that can turn into humans, the Puni Bird tribe. Tsubasa explains that a little over a year ago, he fell down to Earth through a portal similar to the one Sora and Elle went through. Somehow, he didn't die on impact, but unfortunately, because he didn't have a magical baby with him, he was still pretty injured. Fortunately, Yo-Yo found him and patched him up, and he's been living with her ever since. In fact, it turns out these portals between Skyland and Earth don't just come from Kabatone creating them. They're also sometimes naturally created for just a moment when big storms come along. For some reason, everything that ends up getting sucked through these portals from Skyland to Earth ends up in Sorashido City, and as it turns out, that's where the Sky Jewels on Earth come from. That actually resolves the plot hole from episode 3 of why humans have no idea what Sky Jewels are. 
if they're only confined to this one obscure city in Japan, it makes sense that humans haven't come up with their own name for them. It would have been okay if the show hadn't resolved it since it's just a nitpick anyways, but it's really nice that this show came back to that detail and added to the world building. Also, we find out Amashiro moved into Yogo's house at around the same time that Tsubasa became in Yogo's care. So Mashiro's parents haven't always been working abroad. Anyways, Mashiro wonders why Tsubasa has been pretending to be a normal bird for a whole year. Tsubasa says that he thought Sora and Mashiro wouldn't believe him if he told them the truth. At this point, Sora's had enough, and she just goes off on Tsubasa. She points out that after she and Elle came over and busted Mashiro's perception of reality itself wide open, Tsubasa could have come in any time and said, Oh, and by the way, you guys, I'm not talking shape-shifting bird. Mashiro tries to calm Sora down, but she can't be stopped. So, Mashiro politely asks why Tsubasa didn't have Yogo build the tunnel back to Skyland for him since it's been over a year by now. Sora agrees with Mashiro and yells at Tsubasa for him to explain himself. Tsubasa, of course, gets really scared and wordlessly shakes his head. All of this commotion scares Elle and she starts crying. With that, the scene fades to black. This whole interrogation is a really well-written scene where even though the characters are at odds with each other, you can sympathize with all of them and understand why they're acting the way they are. On the one hand, you have Sora. This complete stranger has entered the baby's room, and even though Yo-Yo says she knows him, he doesn't have any answers for basic common sense questions. Of course Sora doesn't feel safe with him around, and she's going to lash out at the stranger danger, especially since there's somebody else out there who really is trying to kidnap Elle. But on the other hand, Yogo does say she knows Tsubasa, and she is a trusted figure to Sora, Mashiro, and L. Of course, Mashiro is going to trust Yogo more than Sora is, given that Mashiro's known her for far longer, so it makes sense that Mashiro is the one who approaches Tsubasa more peacefully. On top of that, Tsubasa is peacefully explaining himself to Sora and Mashiro. He's already told them his backstory, and if Sora hadn't intimidated him, he probably would have also explained why he didn't reveal his identity earlier, and why he didn't go back to Skyland. The next day, Mashiro heads off for school, only to find out from Yogo that Sora isn't coming with her. Turns out she was so stressed out by Tsubasa's presence in the house that she stayed up all night watching over Elle. We cut to Sora, where an internal monologue from her shows us another reason why she's so upset at Tsubasa. Turns out a lot of that anger isn't at Tsubasa, but herself. She realizes that if Tsubasa really was one of Kabatone's accomplices, he would have been able to kidnap Elle last afternoon when he broke into the room without her noticing. She beats herself up for not being good enough to protect Elle. But even Sora can't stay up forever. Eventually, she dozes off. When she wakes up, she panics to find that Elle is no longer in the room. She goes looking for her, only to be stopped by Tsubasa, who points out that Elle is in the process of doing something very important. For the first time, Elle stands up. Honestly, it's really sad that Elle's parents will never get to see this important milestone in their daughter's life. But at least Sora and Tsubasa get to be delighted. Elle then falls over, but Sora and Tsubasa catch her just in time before she hits her head. So, they're already starting to patch things over. Tsubasa then invites Yogo and Sora into a room that Sora's never been in before because the door's always been locked. It's filled with model airplanes and all sorts of books. Turns out, Tsubasa's been studying aerodynamics for the past year. The reason? He wants to fly. So, here's the backstory. Long ago, the Puni Bird tribe gave up their ability to fly in exchange for the ability to shapeshift into humans. One day, when Tsubasa was just a chick, he and his dad were hitching a ride on another bird for this very reason, but a gust of wind flung him off the other bird's back. It seemed like Tsubasa was done for, but then Tsubasa's dad dived after him, caught him, and somehow flew him back to safety. It was then and there that Tsubasa gained his desire to fly. But since that moment, Tsubasa's dad was unable to fly again, and he had no desire to find out why he was suddenly able to fly for a little bit just then. He just wanted to stay on the ground where he was safe. And what's more, the other birds mocked Tsubasa for wanting to fly. So, Tsubasa practiced flying on his own, to no avail. One stormy day, Tsubasa tried jumping off a cliff because he thought, well, it's gusty today and maybe it was the wind that caused my dad to be able to fly. And that's when he got portaled over to Earth. 
But it turned out that that was a blessing in disguise because this world is full of people who weren't born with the ability to fly, but created machines that gave them that ability. The reason he hasn't gone back to Skyland is because he wants to stay here and research aerodynamics on Earth. Tsubasa sees Sora smiling and regrets that he said anything. In fact, being embarrassed about being a flightless bird who wants to fly was why he kept his existence as a talking bird a secret in the first place. But Sora thinks that he's really cool for never giving up on his dream, and is a lot like her in that regard. She apologizes for misunderstanding him, and the two happily agree to become friends. Now that the main conflict of this episode is resolved, it's time for Kabaton to show up! He steals a drone that some kids are playing with and turns it into a rod board. Remember back in episode 5 when Kabaton's boss said she would punish him if he continued to fail? Well, he's continued to fail plenty of times since then, and we haven't heard a peep from her. At this rate, that scene may as well not even be canon, and Kabaton may as well be the ruler of the Underg Empire. Anyways, the Rondorg is a giant UFO that creates huge explosions all across the city. Last time Kabaton made a vehicle-sized Rondorg that was capable of citywide destruction, he had to do the whole skin and bones thing, but he doesn't have to do so here for some reason. Okay? Fortunately, Mashiro's just gotten back from school, so she and Sora transform. It's the same Sora-centric cut as always, which I guess makes sense since this whole episode focuses more on Sora than Mashiro- Wait, wait a minute. I've said this three episodes in a row now. I like Sora as much as the next guy, but can we please get Mashiro some love? This is unfortunately a problem that most seasons of Brady Cure have. There's almost always one or two characters that get the shaft in terms of screen time, while the other characters get to soak up the spotlight. Judging by the title of the next episode, it's going to be focused mainly on Tsubasa, but hopefully episode 10 will finally be a Mashiro-focused episode since it's about cooking and the show has previously established Mashiro to be a very good cook. Pure Sky and Pure Prism leap into action, and Yo-Yo tells Tsubasa to take Ellen to the house where she'll be safe. Unfortunately, he immediately fails at this task when Elle summons her magical flying sling, wrenches herself out of his arms, and uses the sling to fly off towards Pure Sky and Pure Prism. So Yo-Yo has to call Ageha and have her track down Elle. Yo-Yo heads back inside the house and tells Tsubasa to follow her inside. But Tsubasa can't do that, knowing that the baby's in danger. So he turns back into a bird, jumps off the hill, flaps his wings, and soars into the sky. And on that cliffhanger, our episode ends. So yeah, it turns out that the secret to Pluny birds being able to fly is probably that they can only fly when it's absolutely necessary to protect the ones they love. How about that? Oh, and guess who the ending theme cure for this episode is? Cure Grace from 2020's Healin' Good Pretty Cure. That's right, the past Cure cameos did not, in fact, stop at just two. I'm really relieved at this. It seems like they're following a clear pattern of going in reverse for lead cures. I'd hope to see some non-lead cures as well, but if not, it's still better than just piddly two cameos. This episode was great. We got to see a side to Sora that we've never seen before. An overprotective one that lashes out at people she perceives as a threat, partially to compensate for her anger at herself for her own fallibility. We also got introduced to a really nice new character in Tsubasa, somebody who is really insecure and shy because he was born into a group that lacks an ability that's common to birds. But thanks to the support of those around him, He's able to open up about his interests and gain confidence in himself. On top of that, he's really good at making sure Elle is doing alright. Finally, I thought the conflict between Sora and Tsubasa and its resolution were both really well written. Again, you could understand why both people were acting the way they were, so it makes sense that they came together at the end. Honestly, even the only thing I didn't like, which is Mashiro becoming out of focus, wasn't as bad as I made it out to be. There are scenes in this episode with Mashiro in them that I didn't mention here in order to keep this review shorter. So this episode is just all around a good time. Definitely check it out if you haven't already.